Massimo Piliucci, it is good to see you again. How are you? I am good. How about you, Dan? Uh, I'm doing all right. Uh, just came off some uh, Jewish holidays, which because we don't get they don't the school doesn't close, simply means that all my work gets backed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, but I'm sorting it out. Um, so let's do our little introductions, and then we can get started. Why don't you go first? I am Massimo Pilucci. I am the KD Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York. And I'm Daniel Kaufman. I'm Professor of Philosophy at Missouri State University. Massimo, we're going to talk about uh, ethics today, um, not meta-ethics as we discussed last time we, d we brought up this topic, but, but good old, plain old ethics. <laughs> and um, it's partly inspired by you know, all the work you've been doing in Stoicism. Um, uh, and so I wanted to get, maybe to get more into what your specific ethical outlook is, uh, and maybe tie that to some more general discussion. Um, you are a, uh, a self-described virtue ethicist. And before we get into the specific variety, maybe you could just talk a little bit about what virtue ethics is. How do you understand virtue ethics? Yeah, it, I, it's really a late discovery for me, or I should say a late rediscovery, because, you know, I studied the ancient Greek, uh, Greeks and Romans when I was all the way back in high school uh, in Italy. And so I sort of, at the time, I was introduced to the concept of virtual ethics. But, you know, when you're a 17-year-old, it's not like ethics is exactly your, your top priority. <laughs> right. You know, your girls are, uh, or whatever else you might be in, into, but, uh, but certainly not ethics. So... So then, then I sort of went along uh, for a long time, uh, buying into the general idea, which is the standard idea in modern moral philosophy, that when we're talking about ethics or morality, we're talking about uh, the sort of, of, of um, actions that are right or wrong, that morality is about, is this action right, is this action wrong? And of course, the two major uh, ways of looking at it, as we discussed when we talked about meta-ethics, um, are, uh, you know, you, some kind of utilitarianism or consequentialism, uh, you know, either in the f form of John Stuart Mill or some more recent version of it. Um, very few modern utilitarians, I think, are follow Jeremy Bentham, rather simplistic version of uh, sort of the, the hedonic, hedonic calculus, as he called it. Although you'd be surprised. Well, it doesn't, I think Singer does, doesn't he? To yeah, I say, although you <laughs> <laughs> that was the surprise part. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that it's fair to say that that, that singer follows directly Bentham, but yeah, it sounds like what he's gotten into recently with this um, um, uh, interesting stuff about effective altruism and, and so on. It sounds very much like it's it's directly inspired by Bentham style utilitarianism. But anyway, let's not go there. Not, at least not today. Maybe right. maybe another, another time. So there's utilitarianism or consequentialism on the one hand, and then there is uh, some kind of deontology on the other hand. And typically the deontology, uh, the deontological approach in, in philosophy, of course, is Kantian or Neo-Kantian. Uh, most people are, fam are familiar with religious deontology, right? If you, if you follow the you know, Ten Commandments or whatever other kind of uh, scriptural uh, commandments, then you're essentially a deontologist. Uh, but, of course, modern moral philosophers tend to follow a secular type of deontology, which was introduced by Kant, you know, the whole idea of a categorical imperative and so on and so forth. Now, so for a long time, I just went along with, OK, well, those are the options on the table. And if I have to really choose between those two, I'm not sure. I sort of most of us, I think, behave uh, most of the times as utilitarians. Uh, sort of in, in terms of for practical stuff, but at the same time, we also have in the back of our mind that the, the, the idea that there are some absolute things out there that you just never do, no matter what the utility calculus tells you. And so, most of us, I think, go around the, the, uh, our lives as some kind of more or less uncomfortable mix of deontology and, and utilitarianism. Now, fast forward a number of years, well, let's say a number of decades. In my life, and it's, you know, at some point when I started getting interested again in philosophy, moving from science to philosophy, and, and then eventually turning into not only my profession, but also sort of a, a, an attempt to more thoughtfully deal with my life, essentially, then I, then I rediscovered virtual ethics. I said, oh, wait a minute, but there is in fact a third way of doing things, and it's a very different way. So very, very briefly, the idea of virtual ethics 
which comes from the Greek and Romans. The Greek and Romans had a number of schools that can be classified as virtual eth ethical, and maybe we're going to get into some of them, of them at, uh, soon, not just Stoicism that happens to be the one that I settled on, at least at the moment. Um, but the basic idea of virtual ethics is that the question for ethics is not, is this action right or wrong, but rather, what kind of life should I live? So it's a much broader question. Of course, part of that question is, well, in this particular occasion, what's the right thing to do? Right. Uh, so you still have to answer the right <coughs> wrong question, but it's sort of a, it's a subset, it's a very small subset, relatively sm a small subset of the entire, of the big picture. Not only that, but the, the emphasis in virtual ethics is on the individual, not on the sort of the point of view from nowhere. Both utilitarianism and the ontology tends to be sort of these, these general ways of looking at things as, you know, individuals are irrelevant. This is supposed to be this general societal view of things. Um, while for virtual ethics, it's exactly the opposite. That, that's, you know, you start with the individual, you start with the here and now, as they say, and then you broaden your, your perspective to society, not, not the other way around. Uh, that's the second major difference. And a third major difference is that whether in, instead of being preoccupied with right and wrong all the time, you're preoccupied with character. What the, the center the center of focus of, of virtual ethics is the development of character. The idea is that if you develop a good character, uh, uh, you know, virtuous character, hence the term, of course, virtual ethics, uh, then you will know most of the times, at least, and as far as it is humanly, humanly possible to know, you will know what the right thing to do is. You, you'll know it because you're that, that kind of person. You're the, right, the kind of person that makes has a good character and, and tries its, its best to make the, the, the right decision. Okay, so, so let me ask you. Um, why, you know, you said that you, you described this sort of developmentally you know, for you know, I was you were aware of the the virtue tradition just from from you know education, high school, reading Aristotle, Plato, uh, whatever. Um, then you know, as you got into philosophy later, you you discovered that um, you know that most of the discussion was uh, from this sort of normative moral theory standpoint, which focuses on the rightness or wrongness of acts uh, and on what our duties are regarding our actions. Um, and then that you sort of migrated back to a virtue theoretical position. Um, why? What, what did you find unsatisfying about the normative moral theoretical approach to ethical questions? Why, why did you go back to virtue ethics? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, th th there's a number of things that I find unsatisfactory about so the modern conception of morality. <clears throat> First of all, um, it seems to me increasingly, it seemed to me increasingly when I was thinking about it, that it just doesn't take the human being seriously. I mean, ethics, after all, is supposed to be about social interactions, right? About how we relate to each other. I mean, this, this is, in fact, it's kind of interesting that if you look at the etymology of the word, right, the word ethos in, 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 uh, in Greek actually means character. It's, it's related to character. And the Romans, particularly Cicero, when they tried to translate, they started translating Greek texts. They didn't have the, the, the a word equivalent for that, so they pick. So, so um, uh, Cicero pick, picked moralis, right, from where our moral uh, come from, morality comes from. But moralis in Latin meant description of, of people's habits, of, of how society works in mm. general. So it was, so it was this idea that ethics and morality are uh, have to do with human interrelationships. Uh, the modern version of it seems a little too, frankly, sort of abstract, legalistic, uh, rigid, right? So it's like, I mean, if you want to talk about rigid, let's talk about Kant for a second, right? Um, so that's, the, that's a guy who actually said, and I, I quote almost verbatim, verbatim, if the whole world should go down into flames because you have to uphold the moral law, well, too bad for the world, right? Uh, you have to uphold the moral law. But that makes no sense. I mean, the moral law, whatever that is, is there in order so that we can live a good and decent and flourishing life. If the whole world goes in flame in order to uphold, uh, you know, the moral law, it's just like you, you're getting your priorities completely turned around here. Uh, so that's that's as far as the Kantian version is concerned, you know, so the, the, the deontological version. Of course, most not modern deontologists are not quite as strict as Kant, but still, that's the basic idea. Similarly, from the point of view of utilitarianism, I mean, utilitarianism 
constantly runs into uh, all sorts of horrible scenarios that are raised as uh, objection to the whole idea that you can do, a, you know, you can meaningfully do a moral calculus. Uh, uh, Mill already was very well aware that the original idea of, you know, Bentham's idea of the Titanians couldn't possibly work because then, then you would have to get into very horrible situations such as, for instance, that if it turns out that the general population's happiness is going to be increased by arbitrarily killing a, 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 a uh, innocent victim, um, and uh, that's okay because the pain you cause or the or the unhappiness you cause to one person is going to be outweighed by you know millions of people who enjoy it. I mean, it's like really no, that's not going to work. Um, and so you know, Mill realized that of course, and he sort of he really did improve on the original system. But even so, even modern you know even if when when you teach utilitarianism sort of into in, in introductory ethics courses. <coughs> There are classical scenarios that are raised against it, like the the, the typical one is the the doctor who has um, you know uh, five patients, each one of whom is has a, a, a vital organ failing, and so the question for you to if the doctor is a utilitarian, you know why why not go outside, just pick you know, a person from the street, a random person from the street, as long as she is healthy, cut up into pieces, and then distribute the her uh, vital organs in order to save five people. For a utilitarian, it's really difficult to say why not, why yeah, that's yeah. wrong. Then I mean, obviously they do have answers. You know, we're, we're, we're simplifying here. It's like it, they do have answers, but to me, those answers have always sounded um, a, a sort of post facto, you know, uh, rationalization of oh crap, I'm, I'm I'm faced by this really horrible situation and I have to come up with it somehow, so, so uh, to an answer with an answer somehow. So contrast this to uh, reading Aristotle or reading the Stoics or reading Epicurus, uh, where you really read a lot of concern for the human condition. You really, uh, you know, these are people who actually speak, at least to me, they really speak directly to uh, human concerns, to the idea that ethics is about, you know, getting the best life possible out of whatever it is given to us. Uh, you know, it's about flourishing. It's about relating to others in constructive ways. So that sort of thing really uh, increasingly struck me as, as as a good idea. Now there is a number of ways to go about it, um, and and that's that's actually one of the things that makes uh, uh, virtual ethics, I think, very interesting for me. I mean, th there is a number of of uh, possibilities out there. And if you don't mind, sort of briefly, the the, the basic taxonomy of it. I, I wrote an article um, about this in um, How to Be a Stoic. Uh, dot org, which is my my blog, um, and the article is not just about stoicism; it's just a general comparison of these different types of virtual ethics. Mm -hmm. ethics. We'll link to that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the basic <laughs> idea is that almost all of, the, of these schools started out with Socrates, who was either the first or certainly the first one of, of whom we know uh, to say that look, the, the the point here is to find out how to live a eudaimonic life. Eudaimonia is, of course, the Greek word, which is essentially untranslatable in English, uh, it's often translated as happiness, but it really means something closer to flourishing. Yeah, it's human flourishing. Yeah, good life, right? Yeah, so, what yeah. is the flourishing life? And so, Socrates was the first one that that sort of put this question really uh, at the forefront. And his answer was, well, the, the flourishing life is a life of virtue, and by virtue, he meant specifically certain specific things. It's um, uh, in particular so this this idea of uh, pursuing wisdom, especially practical wisdom. Practical wisdom is is this ability that you have or that you develop develop of of um, making the right decisions under different circumstances. So you, if you are if you have practical wisdom, no matter what comes your way, uh, you you have an ability to look at the situation and, and figure out what's the best thing to do. Now, from Socrates, we have an interesting split in in his followers. We have so on the one hand, Plato. And Aristotle. Uh, so Plato's Academy and Aristotle, uh, Aristotle's Lyceum. So Plato went uh, very theoretical. So he maintained pretty much most of much of what Socrates was saying, but he started going very metaphysical about it. So he, he, he started saying that uh, this isn't just a question of practical wisdom. This isn't just a question of you can make an argument that 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 uh, virtue is the thing to do to pursue in life. It's that. It's that way because it's a reflection of the absolute form of goodness, right? So, right. so it's his theory of, of forms. 
I don't go there because I tend to minimize, I try to minimize my metaphysics, my metaphysical commitment. So I'm not going to go Platonist. But hey, there is that option. Uh, Aristotle, in some sense, went sort of almost the opposite way, he became very pragmatic about things. And, you know, forget about these ideas uh, uh, out there uh, of which reality is a reflection. Reality is reality, and that's what we have to deal with. And Aristotle was very much, uh, uh, was, was so pragmatic uh, about things, and he was also so taxonomic. He actually came up with a taxonomy of 12 different kinds of virtues, which is always difficult to keep in mind, so I'm not, I'm not even going to try, but my article has a link, actually, to all of the Aristotelian virtues if people are interested. Um, but the, the crucial thing about Aristotle was, look, um, virtue is not the only thing that you need. Uh, that was Socrates' position. Uh, you need more. You need a, a few other things in order to live the flourishing life. You need some degree of uh, education, some degree of health, uh, some degree of wealth. You need a supportive uh, family environment and, so, and social environment. <laughs> Even when so far as to say, you, you kind of also need a little bit of good looks uh, to, you know, just to have a good life. So in other words, he, he said there are external goods which are, at least in moderation, and certainly subordinate to virtue, but they're necessary in order for you to live a flourishing life. If you are, you know, poor and, and uneducated and not particularly bright, you're not going to have a, a, a eudaimonic life. So that was, and this is this is kind of, a, this is actually the most common view of virtue ethics. Okay? But there are others that are kind of interesting. So, so the second major branch uh, off of Socrates' original idea uh, is constituted by the Cyrenaics, which most people ever don't usually talk about, and then the Epicureans. So the Cyrenaics uh, was a, a group that is, was established by Aristippus, and, and Aristippus said, look, the only thing that matters in life is pleasure, and particularly bodily pleasure. The point of life is to accumulate as many bodily pleasures as possible throughout your existence. That's it. Uh, so I'm it was, liking it already. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's kind of hedonism, right? Now, he, he was smart and he was actually sophisticated. I mean, he, he, he knew, for instance, that that pleasure by itself can actually kill somebody or can, you know, really make you, you know, uh, lead you down a, you know, sort of a, a negative path. So he said, you know, you need not to be owned by your pleasures. You, you need to own your pleasures. Right. So you need to still exercise your sort of a rational uh, approach to things. But still, it was pleasures. Epicurus, on the other hand, said, yes, it's about pleasure, but there are different kinds of pleasures. There are bodily pleasures and there are uh, you know, sort of mental pleasures, intellectual pleasures, and intellectual pleasures are more important. Um, and really the point of life is to increase as much as possible your enjoyment of those pleasures, but, mo but mostly to decrease pain. And uh, not only bodily pain, but, all, uh, pain, but also mental pain. So uh, Epicurus famously was, uh, you know, vehemently attacked organized religion because although he did believe in God, he thought that often organized religions sort of are, are used by people for political purposes, for making, you know, miserable, may, may, making other people miserable, essentially, and exploiting them, right? Now, notice this difference between the Cyrenaics and the Epicureans. People have suggested that those two schools influenced Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, respectively. Well, right? Mill himself identifies with the Epicureans and Epicureanism, right. yeah. Exactly, it did. And in fact, the, the Epicurus distinction between sort of low and high pleasures is very similar to Mill's distinction between low and high pleasures. So, so there are connections among these things, you know, like a 2,000 years yeah. apart. Yeah. The last branch of, uh, again, stemming out of Socrates, is the one that most interests me. And that's the, 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 the branch that includes both cynicism in the ancient sense of the term, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, not the modern one, and Stoicism, right? So both the Cynics and the Stoics stuck close to Socrates' idea that virtue is necessary and sufficient for a eudaimonic life, for a flourishing life, unlike Aristotle. So you don't need the external goods, okay? Uh, the flourishing life is accessible, essentially, by everybody. You don't need to be good, to have good looks or to have wealth or to be educated in order to, get, to, to live a eudaimonic life. But then there is a crucial distinction between the cynics and the stoics. The cynics really were very ascetic in, in, their, in their lifestyle. They really said, that's it. You don't need anything else. In fact, everything else you want to stay away from because it's going to distract you. you know, external goods are going to distract you from the pursuit of 
of a flourishing life. The Stoics were kind of stri striking a balance between Aristotle and the Cynics. And they said, no, wait a minute. It, yes, it is true, like the Cynics say, and like Socrates said, that virtue, the pursuit of virtue is necessary and sufficient for the good life. But it's also true that people want uh, some externals for good reasons. And that's because externals are uh, divided into what co they call the preferred and dispreferred indifference, uh, which sounds like an oxymoron, but, I'm, but, but, but it actually is a brilliant idea, I think. So a preferred indifferent is something like wealth or education or, um, or intelligence you know, or, or, or health. And these are indifferent in the sense that your moral value your ability to live a moral life does not depend on them, right? You can, you can live a moral life you can, you can, and you have value as a person, regardless of whether you are healthy or not, healthy or not, uh, ignorant or, 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 or intelligent or, you know, or, or uh, educated. But they are preferred, as opposed to being dispreferred, because other things being equal, they are going to make your pursuit of, of, of virtue easier. They're going to enhance your possibilities of virtue. So everybody can be virtuous, but if you do have the choice, if you do have the opportunity, you should go for education over ignorance, <coughs> over poverty, and so on and so forth. So it's a really nice system if you think about it, because it, on the one hand, it, it maintains this crucial Socratic idea that everybody can live a eudaimonic life. Everybody can live a flourishing, meaningful life. And the meaningful life ultimately has to do with the way you relate to other people. Uh, that's what virtue ethics is really all about. But at the same time, it also uh, keeps some of the Aristotelian insight that, yeah, I know, but people do want certain things and they don't want them because they're crazy. They want them for good reasons. And so the Stoics said, yes, go ahead, do uh, by, by all means, pursue external goods as long as you don't confuse them for the chief good, for the right. thing that really matters in life. Right. Okay. Wow. There's a lot there. So um, I actually, <laughs> actually, I, I am going to want to push push a little bit on some of the the, the the ways in which the Stoic just differs from the Aristotelian, um, um, especially on this point about external goods. Um, but I just want to just what we started with was your reason for just for for sort of moving away from normative moral theories um <clears throat> and i just wanted to sort of make a make a remark or two about that um you know i i also have problems with normative moral theories um uh i mean partly it's because it's abstract they're too abstract um but but it more has to do with the fact that i don't i think ultimately normative moral theories ultimately have to be assessed against our pre-theoretical moral intuitions. That's just the way these things go. If you think about most of the objections to Kantian deontology and utilitarian uh, consequentialism, most of the most potent objections are basically pointing out their perverse results, right? And when you point out their perverse results, what you're doing is you're saying, these theories have results that violate our pre-theoretical moral intuitions, right? Um, um, and you could almost say that a moral theory, that pre-theoretical moral intuitions are to a moral theory a little bit like observations are to a scientific theory. The purpose of the moral theory is to give some sort of a rational reconstruction of these intuitions that we already have. Um, the problem, I think, is that I think that we have conflicting moral intuitions. And so I think the reason why we can never find a sort of a grand unified moral philosophy is because... Uh, the the base data again on which it's based um, is conflicted um, um, in a way that our, our observations are not conflicted uh, and thus don't lead us to, to to these sorts of conflicts in scientific theories. Um, so I think that there's a base problem that you can't have a single moral theory that it will explain all of our intuitions about what's right and what's wrong, what's obligatory, what isn't, um, because I don't think that we're consistent that the, that right. those things are consistent. I agree. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. ahead. A couple of, of, of short comments. So, first of all, yeah, I agree with you. That is one of the problems with uh, sort of overarching theories of morality, such as uh, deontological theories or, or utilitarian theories, 
um, that they do run afoul of some very strong moral intuitions that we have. And when they do, we don't follow the theory anymore. That's so right. It fails. And now, the, the caveat that I will add is that sometimes we do have to recognize that our moral intuitions may in fact be incorrect or unsustainable. But the thing is, what I, but I think that you're still essentially right because that ought to be a very high standard. Okay, so before I go, we as a society get rid of certain moral intuitions, there have to be really compelling reasons. Uh, right. And those typically are other moral intuitions. I mean, I don't think... I don't think ultimately that theories ever overturn a moral intuition. Look, right. it's worth pointing out um, our observations are sometimes incorrect too. That right. doesn't mean that they don't. That doesn't mean that they still aren't the data upon which scientific theories operate. Yeah. And I think that the fact that our moral intuitions are sometimes wrong isn't a reason to think that theories should tell us you know, theory should be prescriptive in, in in that way. It's simply to tell us that you know our feelings on these subjects evolve over time, right? I mean, and they're subject to change. Um, um, but um, so, so, I mean, that's, yeah, that's one of the problems. And the other problem I have with it is actually the one that Aristotle points out. Uh -huh. um, and that is Aristotle essentially tells us why you can't have a moral theory. And that is, he says that, you know, he says in the very general that, that every subject only admits of the precision to which its subject matter allows. Exactly. And the fact of the matter is that what a person ought to do in any given situation is so heavily dependent upon the features of the context that they can't all be specified in advance, such that you could then have a series of prescriptions that would account for all the cases. And so Aristotle, I think, is really telling us, you literally cannot do what people like Mill and like Kant are trying to do um, without ignoring all the fe relevant features that are ultimately what decide in any particular case. That's exactly right. Now, <laughs> people try to turn that into, in, in some sense, into a weakness of, of virtue ethics, and I think it's, it's, main, it's one of the, its main strengths. So the typical objection to virtue ethics is, yeah, but it doesn't give you specific guidance about you know what to do in any particular in a particular situation, and I say yes, that's right. Because there isn't any. <laughs> there, isn't, there isn't any. Because because uh, the general theories like uh, the ontological and utilitarian or consequentialist theories uh, arrive at guidance for specific examples from these very large you know high level overarching principles. But what virtual ethicists realize is, as you just said, is that life is too damn complicated for that. Right. Uh, there is too many variables. There are too many things going on, and you 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 can reason your way through specific circumstances, but you cannot reason your way on the basis of general principles right. because the general principles admit of too many exceptions. So you're going to get it wrong a lot if you do that. If you do if you do it that way, you're going to get it. And I think we see this a lot, especially with religious types. They bring such a rigid top-down conception of morality to questions, and they often get these things wrong because they ignore all the relevant features of the context. Um, it's interesting that someone would claim this is a weakness of Aristotle when it's simply the truth of our situation. Okay. You know, I also point out to students sometimes, if, 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 if deciding how we ought to act in any given case was as simple as applying a theory to a, to a situation, then ethics should be really easy. Yep. Right? right. Um, there would be no need for deliberation. Right. <laughs> but the, but everybody who knows who's ever had an ethical dilemma knows that these are the most difficult yes. things to think through. Right. Okay. <laughs> this is going to have it might have very soon, very, very practical consequences uh, because we talked in the past, you know, we've done a, 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 a conversation about artificial intelligence. Right. Yes, we did. Yeah. And one of the other one of the things that is coming out here is that as artificial intelligence really gets intelligent. To the point of actually making autonomous decisions about you know real life situations, then how are you going to program you know a moral code right. in the AI? And and part of the problem, and of course you know you go all the way to science fiction scenarios like Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics, right? right? Well, there is a whole literature about how the three laws of robotics can be exploited to do really big evil, uh, even right. even even if the robot doesn't actually realize that it's doing actually it. in Asimov's books. And that's right. In, in his robot books, that comes up, and I think the second book in the robot trilogy, that's exactly what happens: is that someone exploits a robot to commit murders. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's, <laughs> the three laws out of the ontological system. Yeah, right? they're top down, right? Top down. <laughs> and, and so I think we're going to face this very quickly, very soon, as soon as artificial intelligence does get that sophisticated, because people will realize that now you cannot program morality into a robot. You have to somehow make it come out organically. In other words, you have to create a character for the robot. You have to teach right. it virtue ethics. It has to develop judgment. That's right. It has which to is, develop judgment. Which cannot be programmed. That's a function of experience. Right? That's exactly. a function of experience. It's all very interesting. Um, um, okay, so so you did say that you uh, espouse, and we know this because of all the work you've been doing, a stoical virtue ethic. So... Um, what was it about? I mean, you said a few things about what you found attractive about it, but maybe you could be a little more complete about what it is you found particularly attractive about the Stoic version of virtue ethics. And then maybe I'll ask you a few questions, challenge you a little bit on the differences between the, where the Stoic differs from Aristotle. But I'm first interested to hear what appealed to you primarily about Stoicism as opposed to the other varieties. Yeah, so maybe one way to, to answer the question is to go about it sort of developmentally. That is, uh, as I said a few minutes ago, I came to virtue ethics sort of late, you know, after having gone through the usual, you know, contemplation of deontology and utilitarianism. And then the, as soon as you get to virtue ethics, most of the time, the first thing that you encounter is Aristotle. The Nicomachean ethics, that's the yeah, most common, the yes. Ethics, right, and that, that's, that's the one, that's the thing. And then, um, if you start getting interested in, in sort of Greek-Roman uh, ethics, then probably your next stop is going to be Epicurus. And that's exactly what happened to me, you know, sort of, sort of developmentally. I went to Aristotle first, and then I said, all right, there's some, that's interesting, but there are some things that really don't convince me. Particularly, Aristotle gets often accused of some degree of um, aristocratic, aristocratic snobbishness, basically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, which I think it's fair enough. Is that because of his, the import he puts on the external goods? Exactly. Okay, yeah. good. I want to return to that later. Good. Go ahead. So I think it's a fair now. I mean, whether he meant it that way or not, it's it's really irrelevant. The question is, if you're interested in that in in that kind of approach, there is that sort of of, of problem that comes uh, that comes up immediately. Uh, okay, so what about Epicurus? So I read Epicurus. You know, the little we have about Epicurus is it's only very fun. fragmentary. Yeah. Um, yeah, but of course there is about there is a lot about Epicurus. There is the Lucretius, uh, the Rerum Natura, which is a wonderful poem, which I actually read. Uh, and translated in part in, in Latin from the Latin. Oh wow! School. Yeah, that was one of the assignments that we had to translate the the Rerum Natura, which was it's, it's a beautiful language. <laughs> yeah. Um, and anyway, so we do know a little bit, you know, and, and also of course we have commentary from a lot of the other schools about Epicurus. Now, the thing about there's n a number of things that appeal to me about Epicurus. Uh, one of which is in fact his rejection of sort of organized religion. Again, remember he was not an atheist. Right. Um, you know, but but he did think that God exists out there. You know, he does his own thing. He doesn't really concern himself with the with the world. And you shouldn't allow other people to exploit you, essentially, uh, on the basis of fear of what God is going to do to you or fear of death and things like that. And that that really appealed to me. Epicurus also has a lot of emphasis, puts a lot of emphasis on uh, sort of intellectual pleasures and in moderate enjoyment of physical pleasures, mm -hmm. uh, which also appealed, appealed to me quite a bit. And especially, uh, he put a lot of emphasis, more even than Aristotle himself, on uh, friendship. Uh, and that, you know, friendship for Epicurus is a fundamental component yes, of yes. A, a, a eudaimonic life. There's no such thing as a, a good life without uh, friendship. Aristotle says the same, uh, but, it, but his emphasis is less drastically on, on, on friendship. Problem is, Epicurus then also puts a lot of emphasis, which is logical within its, 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 its system, on detachment from the rest of society. He's deep, he, he's deep, he's apolitical. Exactly, yes. politically, yeah. particularly from social and political involvement, right? Why? Well, that's because most of the times, you, the only thing you're going to get out of that is, is, is pain, uh, <laughs> either physical or mental, but it's pain. Which the current election season seems to confirm. <laughs> uh, yeah, that one and every other election season. Really. So, I mean, he's got a point there. But, uh, but I do think that one crucial aspect of a meaningful life, at least to me, is in fact social political Yes, of, of course, yes, yes. And that's why I ended up sort of rejecting Epicureanism, essentially. Well, if you 
if you if Aristotle doesn't quite convince you because he has a lot of good things, but there is this issue of too much dependence in my mind at least on on external goods. I certainly didn't want to go Platonic anyway for the reasons that I told you. Right, um, right. You know, it's too metaphysical for my taste. The Syrian eggs are out of the question as far as I'm concerned because it's only about bodily pleasures. Uh, the Epicureans are out because of that reason. Well, that leaves the Cynics and the Stoics. Right. So as a as a principle, as by exclusion essentially. Cynics. They're just too ascetic for you. They're just yeah, too yeah, ascetic yeah, yeah. For, for me, I think, and for most people. It's almost monastic, I guess, right? They're almost monastic. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In fact, they were actually. Uh, Did they have? A, were there orders? Were, were there? No, there were no orders. There, there was. It was really not kind of a, no, no, not a, not a religion. But actually, they did inspire the monastic level, a number of monastic orders during the Middle Ages, during Christian the Christian Middle Ages. And look, there is quite a bit to be. Uh, uh, sort of admiring about the cynics, right? I mean, the sto just the stories about Diogenes, the yeah. cynic, are just wonderful. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure several of our listeners or watchers are, are familiar with some of them, but, but a couple of these are just too good to be, not to be told, right? There's this story where he's, he's approaching a, a, a fountain where he's, he's about to, you know, drink something, and he has, a, you know, he's, he's all his possessions and this little knapsack. And before him, there's this, there's this kid that comes there and, and uses his hands, right, to to uh, uh, get the water and put it and bring it to his to his mouth. And Diogenes was about to get out this little cup that he uses he used to to drink. And he looks at the kid and he says, "This this kid is more wise than I am." And he throws away the cup because it's like clearly that's a possession I don't need because I have my 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 hands to do that, right? So it's just it's wonderful. I mean. Uh, the famous story where Alexander the Great was so impressed by uh, Diogenes that he actually went and, and paid personal visit, right? And uh, in fact, Alexander famously said that if I uh, were not Alexander, I would like to be Diogenes. <laughs> so he goes to Diogenes and, uh, I mean, talk about a compliment, you know, paid to a philosopher, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so he goes to Diogenes and, and, uh, and he says, uh, so anything I can do, you know, what, anything I can do for you, I'll do it. And Diane just looks at, at, at Alexander and he says, get out of the sun. You're blocking my sun. <laughs> That's the only thing I need you to do. Just get out of my sun. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, how can you possibly yeah. not admire? <laughs> right. You need people like that. You just don't want to be it yourself, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You just don't want to be it. I mean, one can say you don't have the guts to be it yourself. Right. Maybe so. Um, but, but uh, you know, I, can, I think I can honestly admire the cynics without actually being Right, cynic. right, right. Well, now we're left just with this stoicism. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't come to it just by elimination. I mean, Pretty much. <laughs> now, even the stoics are, you know, they have a reputation of being pretty harsh. Uh, you know, they're, they're not, stoicism is not an easy philosophy necessarily uh, because it does de-emphasize quite a bit the importance of externals. Right. Not as much as the cynics, uh, but certainly a lot. Uh, and, and so you are, you know, if you are a stoic, you are still supposed to be living a somewhat minimalist lifestyle. Now, it just happens that before discovering stoicism, I always lived a minimalist lifestyle. <laughs> I was never into, you know, consumerism. I was never into buying a bunch of things. I mean, I, I buy the things that make me my life comfortable. Can you me. describe living in Manhattan as a minimalist lifestyle? I'm wondering about that. <laughs> yes. You will sue, actually, because you vi you'll visit I'm my apartment. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's a one-bedroom, better, right. you know, better little furniture. Uh, it's, it's very minimal. In fact, it's one of, the, one of the interesting things about living in a place like New York uh, is that yes? It is of course very expensive, right? But it's also you, your your carbon footprint is very small. You can't have that much stuff. That's right. <laughs> you, can't, you cannot have that much stuff, and you, you you live piled up on you know on top of other, a lot of other people in a very small space. So yeah, yeah. it is actually a, a different kind, of course, of minimalism. But it is a minimalist lifestyle. It's not poverty, but it's minimalism, no. right? <laughs> right. And in fact, that's one of the things that people do mistake about. The Stoics, right? This, one of the things about that I found out about practicing Stoics is that if you happen to mention, I don't go around saying, "Oh, I'm a Stoic." Hi, I'm a Stoic, right? right. Uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, because it sounds pretentious, uh, and, and and second of all, because people look at you like, You're "What?" <laughs> uh, but of course, people will, in fact, if they know me, they'll know. I mean, and right. if, if they know me personally, or because through my my writings, I mean, it's almost impossible these days. Uh, besides, I have my tattoo. 
Did I, did I show you my no, tattoo? No, you have a stoic tattoo. I have a stoic tattoo. Oh, that's awesome. Is that so, new? Stoic fire, uh, which is representative of the, the, the fire that, that created the universe, you know, the logos that created the universe. Wow. And, and the tattoo says, I mean, I don't think you can read it, but it says, Ik et nunc, which means here and now. Uh, which is the the idea about stoic mindfulness? You want to pay right. attention to what's happening right now, right here, uh, in your in your life. Anyway, so you know, people just, especially during the summer, they see this tattoo and it's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> then you get to tell them, right? <laughs> yeah, so it becomes a sort of a conversation uh, piece, right? But uh, but besides that, the, the thing is that that I find fun, funny actually uh, and challenging is that as soon as people ask me about stoicism, they say, oh, so stoicism, it's about you know, lack of emotion, you know, suppressing emotion. It's about um, you know, going through life and with a stiff upper lip and all that sort of stuff. And it's actually none, none of those things. But one of the things that they, one of the misconceptions about stoicism is precisely that it's a very austere kind of lifestyle. It's not. I mean, think about some of the... Right, Roman emperors were yeah. Stoics, right? <laughs> Roman emperors. You know, Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic. Uh, Seneca was a, son of a, a, a Roman senator who was a huge landowner. I mean, he, he owned land all over the empire. So right. he was, was filthy rich, okay? Even by modern standards, he was pretty damn rich. Uh, so how do you reconcile that with uh, what I said? It was a minimalist lifestyle. It's about the attitude towards externals. Exactly. Yeah. It is about the fact, and you know, Seneca says this several times. Now, in the case of Seneca, you know, people have accused him of being a little disingenuous about, yeah, of course you're going to say, you know, going to write stuff that rationalizes your, your, your wealth. But the same exact things were written by Epictetus, who was a slave. So it, it's not really like there was much of an inconsistency between the Stoics them, among the Stoics themselves, regardless of their social status. In fact, one of the things, again, unlike Aristotle, one of the things that I find uh, really interesting about stoicism is that it is ecumenical from that perspective it can you can be a rich person you can be a really poor person you can be a middle class person like I, myself and you will find quite a bit to be practiced and to be understood about about stoicism you're right it is about the attitude it's about the idea that as Epictetus said never think of what you have as your stuff you know your money or your things or your apartment your house your wife your husband all of what you allegedly have, it's actually given in trust to you and it can be taken away on a moment's notice. And, therefore, and if you do lose it, uh, you're supposed to be saying not that, oh, I lost this, but just I gave it back. Yes, of course you're wealthy, but, and you know, as Seneca was, but Seneca in the end lost everything. Yeah. I mean, he lost. He, he actually tried to purchase basically his his, his um, family's uh, and in particular his, his wife life uh, with with Nero by uh, with the emperor Nero by basically giving away most of his wealth to the emperor himself and in, so that he could be allowed to retire. And, and Nero initially said yes, and then he said no, forget it. I just need you. And then eventually Seneca had to commit suicide in order to save the little that was left of his estate for, for, for his family. So he did lose everything in the end, right? Um, but the idea is that if he was in fact a Korean stoic, he would have said, well, I gave I it back. It, and then now <laughs> I <it> back. <laughs> All right. So, so that's, you gave a good, good sense of, of what you find appealing about this. And so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit. Uh, let me, let me ask a few, pose a few challenges. So, um, I actually, one of the, I actually find the, the, the acknowledgement of the relevance and even some of the necessity of externals to be rather refreshing in Aristotle, because it seems to me almost a, a certain kind of it re reflect a certain kind of maturity. Um, one of the things that I think we're obsessed with today is a kind of uh, a relative, a somewhat adolescent notion of fairness, um, and also a notion that somehow we should only ever suffer the the costs of things for which we are completely in control um, um, and um, I, I I want to say that you know one of the things I think to be fair to Kant I think Kant realized uh, because he wasn't stupid um, how extreme some of the things he's saying were but I think that part of the reason he said those things was he really believed that 
we don't have that much control over what the outcomes of our actions are. We only have we only have control over our own will, and so so right. the, the the outcomes are somewhat left to themselves, right? Um, and it and it wouldn't be right to hold a person responsible for the thing. You know, I could have do all the right things, and the outcome could still be terrible because yeah. of circumstances I have no control over. So I think that that you know when you're focusing on the rightness and wrongness of acts, there does seem to be more of this ought implies can principle underneath, right? But when we're focusing on whether a person's life should be called a flourishing life, whether a person's life should, in a sense, be admired in a certain way, it would seem to me then that the externals actually do count, right? I mean, yes. So, so now, go, let me give yeah, you, go ahead. Let me make a couple of comments. So, first of all, obviously, I don't want to convince you or anybody else that you know, let's say, the Stoics are better than Aristotle. If what if whatever works, I think actually one of the one of the I, I wrote an essay recently for uh, the Philosophers Magazine, the, their their online website about the distinction between ancient ethics and, and modern ethics. And maybe uh, we, can, we can link to that as well so that people can take a look at it. Absolutely. Um, and one of the things that I say there, which is not original with me, this is an idea uh, at, that, that at least has been put forth by William Irvine, uh, who is a modern philosopher who also has uh, uh, written quite a bit about stoicism. Uh, he said that the important thing actually is to realize that it's a good idea to develop to, or adopt a philosophy of life. Whether that ends up being, you know, Aristotelian in nature or Epicurean or Stoic, Stoic, it really doesn't ne necessarily matter that much. It depends on personalities. Some people may be more prone to to uh, certain kinds of ideas, and others, you know, sort of constitutionally prone to certain kinds of, you know, respond to certain ways. Um, as long as you sort of get into the habit of thinking about what it is that you're doing and, and why you're doing it and, and all that. But setting that aside, a couple of comments you made about Kant. And, and externals are interesting. First of all, we said a few minutes ago that uh, both Bentham and especially Mill were influenced by some of the virtual ethical schools, particularly by, by the Cyrenaics and the Epicureans, uh, respectively. Kant was influenced by Stoicism. So right. a, a lot of the stuff that you see you know, about duty in Kant, it's really a re-elaboration of you know, the idea of virtue as understood by, by the Stoics. So, And that is why, by the way, there's this emphasis on on the idea that that um, ought implies uh, can, that actually is a fundamental Stoic principle. Uh, the Stoics adamantly said, you know, if something is impossible, that's there's no point in even trying to do it. It's right, just right. you don't you you not you're not even gonna go there. It's not a, oh I would like for things. No, it, the Stoics were very much rooted into the reality of things. It's the factual matters of things. If something is factually doable, then by all means try to do it. But if not, then it's out of your it's out of your hand. Now you mentioned, rightly so, this idea that well intentions are under my control, but outcomes are not. Well, Epictetus and Chiridion, the handbook of Stoicism, starts out, and I quote almost verbatim here, depending on the translation you use. Some things are under our, our control, other things are not under right. our control, right? right? This, um, and the way the Stoics cashed out this, I think it's, uh, there's a beautiful analogy, which you find in Cicero, who was not a Stoic, but he was sympathetic uh, to, he was actually more of an academic, as in the sort of a uh, post-Platonic academic. Um, but he realized that there was a lot of a lot of good stuff to be said about stoicism. So so he wrote about stoicism with a, uh, in a in a in a positive fashion, and he uh, uh, he is one of those uh, ancient authors that presents this this interesting metaphor. He says, look, let's suppose that you are an archer and you want to hit a target, right? What you want to focus on is taking the best shot that you can. That's what your goal should be, not hitting the target. Right? You, what you should desire is to uh, get the best shot possible. As far as hitting the target, that should be a preferred, your preference, okay. but not your desire. Because, of course, all sorts of other things can happen. The wind can blow. The, somebody <laughs> can run off with the target. Right? <laughs> shot just completely off the target, right? Now, what are you going to do? <sighs> that was out of your control. And so you, the, the focus should be on internal goals, essentially, on, on, on the way you want to behave, you want to act, on what your priorities are. The outcomes are not in your hands. You can influence the outcome, of course, because, you know, you can. Uh, that, that's another one I mentioned earlier, uh, a, common, a lot of, of common misunderstandings about stoicism. A lot of people hear this, the, the, the phrase from Epictetus, and they say, ah, so that's a counsel for, 
disengagement and you know for for not really being taking responsibility of things that's not the idea remember as you mentioned a few minutes ago some of the stoics were politicians and emperors they very much tried to influence outcomes right right, right. but marcus aurelius uh, himself says a number of times in, in the meditations like you know i go out in the morning and i try to do the work of a man I try to do the best thing that I can, but then I have to accept the outcome of equanimity because the outcome doesn't depend just on what I want. Right. It depends on whatever a lot of other people are doing. It depends on fate. It depends on all sorts of stuff. But how can that not, I mean, so do the Stoics then have a very different list of virtues than Aristotle does? Because I was just thinking of some of the standard virtues that Aristotle will mention, right? And right. it seems to me that there are externalities that could prevent you from developing those virtues, right? I mean, in, in other words, so, so take, a vir yeah. take a virtue like courage. Right. That requires that I have some opportunity in which to exercise it, right? Right. Take, take, right. take, 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 a, take, a, you know, take a virtue like generosity, right? That requires that I be in a certain condition such that I'm able to be generous. In other words, right. I, I don't see how one can have a virtue theoretical picture of – the good life, and not acknowledge that to some degree one is dependent upon externals that are not within one's control. You said before that the Stoics, you know, um, you don't even need good health uh, to be able to be, but presumably you would need good mental health, right? Um, if you're if you're if you're uh, catastrophically schizophrenic, or 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 um, you're not going to be able to uh, develop many of the virtues that that Aristotle certainly described. So. How does the Stoic get around that problem? No, th those are very good questions. And I think that, that you, you just hit, especially with the mental health issue, you just hit some of the limits of Stoicism. I mean, we're still talking about a person who is overall in reasonable mental, mental state, not physical necessarily. The physical actually is a, it's, is a different one. You can, you can be suffering um, you know, from a lot of physical ailments and still, uh, in fact, exercise, use those to exercise your courage. For instance, because courage doesn't mean just physical courage. It also it's a courage to to endure pain, for instance, or to endure whatever situations life throws at you. Right? It's, it's a it's a it's a moral courage, not just physical one. But you are right that we're still talking about somebody who can who falls within sort of the normal range of mental abilities of human beings. Now it is true that modern applications of stoicism, uh, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy have actually been applied to mental conditions, right? Uh, so there, there are people that are autistic, mildly autistic. There are people who are depressed, uh, for instance, uh, who have, in fact, or even people who suffer from uh, bulimia, for instance, or, or uh, you know, anorexia, uh, nervosa. All of those people have actually been demonstrated to, to benefit right, from right, right, things right. like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is really a therapeutic implementation of some of the of the stoic ideas. So right, right. even there, there is some leeway. But yes, we're talking about somebody who is in reasonable control of, of his own uh, sort of mental states. Right, and right. by the way, we do know, and I have to acknowledge this, we, we know today from modern cognitive science that we're much less in control even of our normal mental states yes. than Stoics probably would have thought, right? I mean, there is a lot of, we know from, from cognitive science that there is a lot of what going on, goes on in our brain that is subconscious and really outside of our control, and we often are not even aware of it, right? Um, but still, even con modern cognitive science does does. Agree. Let's say uh, studies like uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Dan Kahneman, uh, uh, for instance, uh, is his idea of a fast and slow uh, processing of information in the brain. Right. The, the the fast one is the subconscious, and the 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 the, the slow one is the the conscious level of analysis. We do have a conscious level of analysis. We do make rational decisions, and that's the part that is actually of concern to Stoics. Now, to go back to your idea, whether I sort of you know, what about the the virtues? So Aristotle, as I said. Um, recognized 12 different virtues. He, you know, he, was a, he, he really was a taxonomist. I mean, he, was, he was, yeah. you know, wanted to make lists. Right, right. right. And, and here they are. Here, here, these are the Aristotelian uh, uh, virtues. Courage, temperance, liberality, magnificence, magnanimity, proper ambition, patience, truthfulness, wittiness, friendliness, modesty, Righteous indignation. I love righteous indignation. Right. <laughs> one of my now, the Stoics, on the other hand, were a little more minimalist about this sort of stuff. They recognized actually four virtues, um, four cardinal virtues, and these are 
uh, wisdom, pr practical wisdom, uh, what the, the Greeks called phronesis, uh, uh, courage, uh, justice, okay, and uh, temperance. Now, not only that, not only there's only four, but in fact, the Stoics, from Zeno, who was the founder of Stoicism, to Chrysippus, who is uh, uh, um, the, the, he was the third head of the Stoic, and he was largely responsible for a lot of the Stoic doctrines as we understand them today. Uh, both of them said we're actually um, um, supportive of the Socratic idea that there really is fundamentally one virtue. This is the so-called doctrine of the unity of virtues. Mm -hmm. There's only one virtue, that's wisdom. And all the other ones are essentially aspects of, of wisdom that take form, that take shape. Or applications of wisdom in different areas. Correct. They're, they're different applications of wisdom. So there really, there really is only one. And, and if that's the case, I mean, if you buy in that, in that way of looking at things, right, then no matter what, well, almost no matter what, life throws at you, you can always exercise wisdom. You can always react with character to the situation. Right. Right? So the stoical characterization of the virtues is much more internal, such that you can satisfy them even if you're in not not in you know, Aristotle's. Are, many of them are external, and they do require a kind of. Um, um, and I don't want to. I don't want to beat this to death. I, just one last thing, um, because this was something that was prevalent in the time when the Stoics were active, and that is. Even something like courage, though, I mean, one's capacity to exercise that can be taken away from a person from the outside. I mean, I'm thinking of people who are either enslaved or people who are uh, extremely mistreated. Um, you know, if you read a book like Primo Levi's Survival in Auschwitz, one of the things that you see is that there is a point to which you dehumanize people to which you actually, they behave terribly towards each other. Right. And I'm wondering, do you think that the Stoics maybe didn't appreciate enough the extent to which, yes, it's all very well to talk about, you know, this in, these internal qualities that you always have mastery over, even if you're, but there are sets of external conditions that are so bad that, that they really do make it impossible for a person to, Absolutely. So there are a number of, of uh, this is a very interesting observation. So, so there's a number of things that, are, that, uh, that hopefully I'll be able to bring up in a, in a couple of minutes. So one is um, the Stoics thought that only the perfect sage is capable of complete mastery of, of wisdom. Mm. Uh, actual human beings are not. And there's, ne there's never been a sage. There will never be a sage. This is one of the, ref the in my mind, refreshing things about Stoicism as opposed to, let's say, Christianity, where, of course, there is a role model, right? But that role model is a god. Right. And it's, you know, that's, it's impossible to achieve, uh, sort of by definition. For the, for the Stoics, the sage is never real. It's not, it's not an actual person, but it is a, a, it's, a, it's an ideal. It's something to which you, you want to strive, right? Then you will fail because you're a human being. That's one point. The second point is a lot of the Stoics actually did go through some of the situations you're going, you're talking about. Again, Epictetus was 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 a slave. Uh, uh, the Stoics, just like the Christians, were actually persecuted by a number of Roman emperors, particularly Nero, Vespasian, uh, and Domitian, uh, because of course you know emperors often didn't like this idea of virtue and yeah, of course and <laughs> stuff. It was they, they, they were criticized by the Stoics, and so the Stoics, as a result, were either expelled, you know, uh, put in sent in exile, like Epictetus or uh, Musonius Rufus, or killed. Uh, like Seneca, for instance, and, and a number of others. Um, so there was this, this issue that even under those conditions, however, you can exercise uh, you know, as much courage, as much wisdom uh, as you can. And there are modern examples. I mean, you mentioned uh, Primo Levi, but another good example is Viktor Frankl. Uh, Viktor Frankl, who later then, uh, you know, who also had a similar experience in concentration camps and eventually wrote a beautiful book about it and, and, and sort of he established this, this form of therapy, which was called logotherapy, which is a precursor really of, of CBT, of cognitive behavioral therapy. Well, Frankl actually uh, was inspired by stoicism. He actually <laughs> writes about stoicism and he says, you know, this is, this is one way in which you can make sense of this thing. More recently, um, James Stockdale. The uh, admiral who ran yeah, for vice president. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, he actually wrote a book about how Stoicism, what, and particularly Epictetus, was what got him through uh, seven years, I believe, of solitary confinement 
in you know in a prison camp. Uh, I think it was in, in Korea or Vietnam. I honestly, at the moment, I'm not sure. But you know, people can 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 download it. Actually, this it's a uh, is is um is essay about this is freely available on the internet. So there are cases like that, and then there is one more thing. So the Stoics. Uh, what I'm about to say will sound strange. We're big on suicide. And <laughs> if, if done properly. Um, so if taken seriously. So better to take an exit than to allow yourself to get degraded to the point to which you're no longer able to. So they recognize a human could be brought to this point. Exactly. By externalities. Exactly. So Very interesting. several times refers to, uh, you know, to this situation as the open door. He says, if things really become unbearable, if your pain is so unbearable, or if you are so crippled or so old age that you cannot do anything worthwhile doing in your life, you cannot help other people, you cannot do anything, you're just essentially close to being a vegetable, then the door is open and the, the open door is the, the suicide. And of course, the, the Stoics did commit suicide uh, for a number of reasons. Zeno himself, apparently, the founder of Stoicism, commit, committed suicide because of old age. He was getting very frail and he figured he had nothing else to teach. He couldn't have an enjoyable sort of eudaimonic life anymore. And so he committed suicide. Uh, and of course, a number of political figures. I mentioned Seneca, but especially one of the uh, so role models of Stoicism was Cato the Younger, who was an enemy, uh, you know, opponent of Julius Caesar. He committed suicide in order not to be used as a pawn uh, by by Caesar as a political pawn by Caesar, so there is always that option for the Stoics. It needs it, it needs to be taken very seriously. Okay, uh, Epictetus turns around immediately and says, "But if you don't take that that open door, that means that you find something worthwhile, and so stick with it, man. Right, right. Regardless of how much pain you are right now, if you don't want to go through the open door, that means you still find something useful, something worthwhile." in life, and then go on and do it without complaining about it. Just, just do your job as a, as a human being. So it's a, it's a very appealing, again, not for everybody necessarily, but it's a very appealing and, and you know, seriously coherent way of looking at, at, at life. It's, a very, it's very serious. I mean, it's, it's, to be, it's to be taken seriously is what I mean. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, right. it's not um, glib about any of these things. Um, um, no, um, and um, fact, Epictetus had, a, especially Epictetus had a, a, a very good sense of humor about things. You know, one of my favorite quotes from Epictetus uh, is in the discourses, and it goes something on the lines of, uh, well, if I have to die today, let's, let's do it. But if not, then I'd rather go to lunch because it's lunchtime and I'm hungry and this is the kind of thing that I want to do. And it's, it's like, you know, he has this kind of sort of light, um, you know, retort uh, occasionally from time to time throughout, throughout his, his writings that sort of makes me like, yeah, you want to take life seriously. But at the same time, it's pre it is precisely this idea that certain things matter and other things don't matter, that a lot of the things that most people think that matter actually don't ultimately matter. These, these are not, you know, going through life accumulating wealth for the sake of accumulating wealth, not because you want to do good or because you want to, you know, it enables you to do other things, but just because it's wealth per se, right, is the kind of thing that for Epictetus and the Stoics just didn't matter. It's the kind of thing you get to the end of your life and you look back and you say, oh, gee, I made one more million dollars. Right, what did I do? <laughs> so what? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Why, why are you doing this? All right, so so very quickly, the last thing I wanted to ask you, um, and this maybe may just may get you to say something about the, the differences maybe between the modern version that you espouse and the sort of the original ancient versions. But what ultimately um, grounds? Uh, what's the, what are the ultimate grounds of the virtues? In other words, um, when you when you when you when you take a eudaimonistic approach to ethics, and you and and, you're, and you want to be talking about human flourishing. That excellence or flourishing is an inherently teleological concept. Right. It implies that the thing you're talking about has some purpose or function that either can be fulfilled or not be fulfilled. Right. Now, in Aristotle's case, um, it's grounded in human nature and it's grounded in a teleological view of human nature. Right. Um, I'm assuming that for the Stoics, it also rested in some con some conception of a teleological view of human nature, maybe also combined with the cosmology, as it did for Aristotle. Right. But we no longer hold a teleological view of human nature. Most um, of 
Well, I mean, I mean, <laughs> modern philosophers typically don't. Right, right. Um, and so, what I want to know is then, what are the what are the modern grounds, and in your mind, what are the grounds for uh, human flourishing, such that you get the particular virtues that you get? Right. No, that's that's an excellent question, and there's a number of people who have been actually working on this on on these particular project. Uh, one of them is an author, a philosopher who's now retired named Be Becker, who um, uh, wrote this book called A New Stoicism, where uh, he, he tries to address exactly the kind of problem you're talking about. And William Irvine, who I already mentioned, does a similar job in, in his book on, on Stoicism. Um, other modern philosophers, such as Philippa Foote, for instance, uh, Alasdair McIntyre, uh, they have done similar job, a similar job for Aristotelian uh, type of virtue ethics. Or although, no, although McIntyre is a Thomist, so he's yeah, so he's ultimately going to appeal to teleology. Ultimately, yes. Yes, yes. But he's done a lot of work that actually can be sort of configured as generally uh, rehabilitating virtue ethics. Uh, Foot, in particular, on the other hand, is, is straightforward virtue ethics uh, from that from that perspective. So there's a number of philo modern philosophers who have been uh, sort of interested, and in, I, I myself am interested in the set of, precisely the set of question you just asked. And yes, teleology is out, but human nature is not, at least not in my mind. Okay, so, so talk about that for a little bit. So it's it's true that even among my son, I find it very interesting. As you know, I come from biology, right, from evolutionary biology in particular. And going into philosophy, I, I found that the concept of human nature is a given among evolutionary biologists. It's like, of course, there is such a thing as human nature, although they don't understand in, in a, a essentialist Aristotelian uh, perspective. perspective. They, they understand it as a... Um, sort of a, a, a set of propensities and characteristics that 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 identify the human species as significantly distinct from any other uh, species of primates. So there's nothing. We're not talking essentialism here. Um, but in, in in evolutionary biology, that's sort of a given. Yes, of course, there's such a thing as human nature. Um, there are human universals. There are you know there are things that every human population known to you know to history and culture does. Uh, and, and those count as components of human nature. Um, and one of these things, by the way, is, you know, you, you, other things considered, uh, other things being equal, you want a, uh, uh, to be able to pursue your own projects, you want friends, uh, you want some kind of recognition from the social group within which you happen to be, and so on and so forth. There's a number of things that we, pretty much all normal human beings, by normal I mean non-sociopathic. But you take uh, as human universals cross-culturally. Right. And, okay. you know, there's a lot of anthropology that sort of uh, backs this up. Okay. Now, you go into a philosophy department, and people look at you like, like you're a Martian, if you talk about these days, if you talk about human nature, it's, it's like, true. Oh, it's yeah. thing is human nature. It's like, what do you mean there's no such thing as human nature? Um, so, so it's an interesting dis discussion right there. My perspective is that, yes, there is such a thing as human nature. And what virtue ethics is, fundamentally, in its different you know, aspects and varieties, it's a recognition of the fact that human beings are a particular type of social animal. Actually, they're a particular type of animal. They are, the Stoics would say... Uh, that there are two things that are fundamental about humanity. We're social and we're capable of rationality. That means that when the Stoics say live according to nature, what they mean is don't, they don't mean go around you know, doing tree hugging or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> they mean exercise your, uh, your rational ability in order to come up with the best type of social living that you can possibly come up with. And that, of course, is very much open-ended. Right. And so the, the but the practice of, of the, the virtues, especially if you if you buy into this idea that really there is only one virtue and that's wisdom. What that means essentially is the application of reason to the good living within a, your society, to good living in terms of you being able to pursue your, your own um, goals as an agent, but within a social milieu where other people are capable of doing that and allow you to do that and facilitate to do that as well. Baker uh, goes so far, the, the, uh, the, the guy that I mentioned a minute ago, he goes so far actually as, as reconstruct the concept of virtue in modern, in modern, you know, from a modern perspective as the maximization of, of um, agency within, within a certain conception of human nature. Because you can also say, well, the psychopath also wants to maximize his agency. Yes, but he's an abnormal human being. Right. He's, he, his nature is not typical of the uh, – right, right, right. Um, 
So the last, let me just ask you the last thing, um, and then and then we can we'll stop. It's a good place to stop. Um, because as usual, we went way beyond the hour. <laughs> well, it's, it's only one hour and ten minutes. Oh yeah, that's no, right. we're doing good. We're doing good. I've been keeping an eye on it. I know. Um, um, and C- C.S. Lewis actually makes this objection in the abolition of man, um, and whether or not you take it as an objection, uh, it's certainly you're not still though going to get the kind of supposed to that you're going to get out of an Aristotelian picture, right? In other words, you you can say, okay, there's a human nature and to cultivate these virtues is to fulfill that nature, but you're not going to get an answer to the question, well, why is it good to fulfill my nature, right? You're not going to get that sort of, well, you're supposed to fulfill your nature, which you get when you fit the Aristotelian picture into the larger cosmology and presumably the Stoic when you fit it into the larger cosmology and then, of course, in the Judeo-Christian. Um, so is it that we just simply, we, we have to accept that we're not that we're not going to be able to go a certain level deeper in terms of answering certain kinds of questions? Or do you think we can? Or do you think the questions are bad questions? I, I go for the latter. I think that the bad the question is a bad question. It's bad to ask why it's good to fulfill your nature. No, I don't. I don't necessarily think that that the question itself, I suppose, is bad. But I think it's misleading. It's going in the wrong direction. It's going toward again some kind of sort of foundational, mm. overarching uh, uh, kind of concept, uh, precisely like the one that we the ones that we started this this show with and we said that they're, they're right. not a good starting point right we we it's the, the ask asking that question sort of brings you either in a in a, in a into a sort of never-ending uh you know loop of, of further and further and further questions right. Like, right. just like any foundational question really i mean in philosophy generally i think uh it's fair to say that after quine at least and wittgenstein we have abandoned and for good reasons, yes. foundational questions. I right? agree. Yeah. So we don't we don't ask anymore. Well, what's the foundation? What, the, what foundations are of induction of inductive reasoning or deductive reasoning? We don't do that. We just say, well, inductive reasoning works. It has certain char- characteristics. It, it has certain limitations. And that and what we want to do, what we want our uh, out of our epistemology and logic is to understand right. um, inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, how they work, and what you can do and not do with them. But we don't ask anymore on what are they based on. At some point, they're just tools that right. you have, and that's it. And they work relative to some conception of working, right? Correct. And we, we don't even we can't even really go beyond that in a sense. Exactly. Um, and exactly. so I'm happy with stopping that that query from a virtue ethical perspective at the level of well, uh, virtue understood as either the pursuit of wisdom, which is the ability, remember, to do the right thing under any circumstances, right? Ideally. Right, right. Or understood as Baker does as the perfection of human agency. So so the ability to, to pursue your own life within a social context, right? I'm happy to say and that's where the box stops. Yeah. Um, is it, why is it good for me to do that? Um, Baker has an interesting uh, uh, bit there in his book. He says, look, for a Stoic, a modern Stoic, what ought to do, ought means, you know, when I say I ought to do this, it's an instrumental mean, it, it is, is, a, it is, um, is it along the lines of, if I want to have a social life where I'm going right, to be able right. to pursue my goals, then I ought to do certain things. Yeah. It's, it's, a, um, um, it's not, obviously not a categorical imperative, yeah. it's a conditional imperative. It's accepting a certain framework relativity, right? I mean, exactly. within the context of human nature, as we understand it, this is what it is to live a good life. Right. Now, if you ask me, well, what's a really good life separate from anything like that? The answer is that's not a good question, right? I mean, that's... Exactly. Uh, <laughs> Talk last time about, uh, you know, riles and categories. Yes, yeah, right. Right. I think that asking that question, that last question you just asked, would be a category mistake. Yeah, well, yeah. That's that's it. That's that's the end of where you know, that's where the buck stops. Right. You know? Beyond that, uh, if you keep asking, well, what is it good about this? Uh, then you reach the point where there is no answer because right. the is informed. And you know, it's it's actually you could take it as evidence of that that when we reach beyond that, we go su- we typically go supernatural, right? That's right? I mean, that sort of evidence that you've reached the the end point is that beyond that point, you start getting into stuff that's unverifiable, un you know, just just um um. Yeah, I think I think that that's that, that's a that's a fair and a good answer. Well, all right, Dr. Piliucci, this was uh, enjoyable as always, and. Uh,
again. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure we will. And um, take well, care. Fate permitting, as the Stoics right. would say. <laughs> fate, fate permitting. Um, um, and uh, thank you so much, and I will see you soon. It was a pleasure. All right. Thank you, Massimo. Bye-bye.